And now let's dive in. Our first conversation will look at the government's multi-pronged strategy for combating resistance to antibiotics. And for that, I'm delighted to welcome Beth Bell, the director of the National Center, Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to the stage. And joining us by phone is Bill Flynn, deputy director for science policy at the Food and Drug Administration's Center for Veterinarian Medicine. Um, due to some transportation issues this morning uh, in DC, obviously, as you all know, Dr. Flynn was unable to join us in person, but we're grateful to have him dialed in, and they're here with my colleague, Steve Clemens, Washington Editor-at-Large. So Steve, the floor thank is you, yours. Thank you, Emily. Hi, Bill. Hi, oh, where is he here? Where is he? Is Bill online? Oh, good oh, there morning. He is. Okay, I just want to let you know we see you up there. We have a giant room of people here who are looking at your uh, uh, great countenance here on the, the TV. They've all uh, gotten over the metro apocalypse, so congratulations to everyone in the room. Uh, and we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to be uh, with you all morning. So I'm going to be the one and only moderator. We're all going to get there. How many of you are kind of people in antibiotics types? Put your hands up. How many of you are chicken folks? I saw the chicken far. There's the high, high, because I've got a. Here we go, chickens and then uh, turkeys, same group. Oh, we got turkeys back there, cattle, right up front, right? There's my friend from Houston, right? Yale came in from Houston for this. Uh, and, and of course, pork, pigs, hogs, okay. We've got a nice diverse group, people and everyone else. And that's what we're going to talk about today, Beth. I'm going to, not to crowd you out here. Um, <coughs> Beth, why don't you start out, and then I'll jump to Bill, but basically, give us some sense of the scale of why this is a significant topic. The Atlantic prides itself on hosting and organizing uh, 3D events, 3D versions of great articles of consequence. So why do you think this question of antibiotic re resistance is one that deserves the attention we're giving yeah. it today? Thanks, Stephen, and pleasure to be here. Um, antibiotic resistance is really one of the most serious public health threats of our time. Um, it's not just about the resistant bacteria. It really uh, threatens modern medicine. You know, if you think about some of the advances of the last several decades in modern medicine, um, advances in cancer treatment, in organ transplantation, um, these, all of the success of many of these uh, interventions really is predicated on our ability to treat infections. People get infections after they, for example, have an organ transplant. So antibiotic resistance really threatens uh, many, many of the advances that modern medicine has made over a number of uh, the past several decades. We estimate at the CDC that over 2 million people a year um, get an antibiotic-resistant infection, and 23,000 people a year die from an antibiotic-resistant infection. And that um, also, on top of that, we have to think about Clostridium difficile, which unfortunately is becoming a very common infection which is related to antibiotic use. And unfortunately, I bet a number of you maybe know people that had Clostridium difficile. This also can actually be quite deadly and, again, is directly related to antibiotic use. And so because resistance is such an important problem and because we know that antibiotic overuse drives resistance, this is why we're um, so focused on um, quantifying the problem and figuring out uh, and then implementing strategies to address it. Before I jump to Bill, can you take us to the cycle? I, mean, we were, I was just hanging out with some folks that were in the, in the hall here because we are doing something where we're bringing both those that are concerned with uh, overuse of antibiotics mm -hmm. in the agricultural sectors, those are used to, um, um, I, would, I would call it either overuse or whatnot in, in the human sector. What is the link? Well, um, you know, um, Overuse of antibiotics is not good anywhere. Um, as we heard, antibiotics are um, a very important uh, kind of treasure that we have um, that um, we need to keep people healthy and we need to keep animals healthy. Um, we know that antibiotic use in uh, healthcare, um, antibiotic sort of um, overuse, drives certain infections in healthcare. And we also um, see that there are foodborne infections. Um, where there is a problem with resistance, and that problem um, is associated with antibiotic use uh, in agriculture. So um, there's um, a, a sort of a parallel tracks, and then there are ways that the two tracks are connected to each other. Bill, let me bring you in. Uh, hopefully you can hear okay. I'm interested in, the, in, in your version. You know, you're the, the, 
Deputy Director for Science Policy at the Center for Veter Veterinary Medicine at the FDA, and there are new rules coming into effect um, really at the end of this year. What are, you, um, what are you most concerned about? What are your up at night issues uh, with regards to livestock and produce and antibiotics? Yeah, thank you, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to sit today this morning. Um, certainly, this is a, a, a critically important issue for us and, and a priority for FDA, and certainly not a new issue by any means, and has been a subject of much scientific debate and controversy really for, for decades. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're actually very encouraged by uh, the, you know, the, the shift in, the, uh, in tone in terms of uh, really moving towards a, a conversation around, uh, you know, not if we should take action, but, you know, what, how we take action and, and how we can work together to, to make progress. I think as Dr. Bell mentioned, you know, this is really an issue that we, we do know, and while, while not, you know, all the definitive science is, is there, and, and that, that science continues to evolve, we certainly do know and do understand that using antibiotics in, you know, in all different sectors, whether it's in human health care or whether it's in animal, uh, contributes to driving this resistance problem. And, you know, it's really incumbent on us that we can look at it from the perspective of the fact that we're all in this together. We all have to contribute to the solution. Uh, you know, rather than continue to debate how much each of us is contributing, you know, that we really need to focus on how we can work together, uh, you know, to contribute to the overall goal of, of trying to manage this problem. You know, resistance is really, uh, again, you know, one of the unfortunate consequences of, of using these drugs. It, it's a bit of a dilemma. While their, 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 their benefits are, are great and we, and we want to use them to manage the disease, you know, the, the consequence, though, is that as we use them, we, we have the effect of driving resistance. So, it do really mean that we have to be very deliberate about thinking about how we use these products and try to use them uh, as judiciously as possible. So it really means that we do need to work together and look at ways in which we can uh, contribute to the overall goal of minimizing resistance. So, Bill, let me push you a little bit. Who are the who are the who are the um, black hats in this equation? Who are the laggards? Who's not? As, as I looked at it, I read a lot of from the, the pork board and have you know, done a lot of research uh, recently on this. It seems that almost everyone's on the same page that this is a problem. But I'm wondering, you know, given where regulation is going, who do you see today are the bad guys in this? Is it doctors? Is it hog farm? Is there anybody not playing along that you want to play along? Um, or, or is is gravity moving the right direction? We don't have much to worry about. Well, I, I wouldn't say we don't have much to worry about, but what I would say is that there, uh, I, I think we we uh, really have an opportunity here to keep keep the forward momentum going. I think one of the things we noticed in the last five years or so is certainly a real shift, you know, for any number of reasons, um, uh, towards uh, really seeing that that it's necessary that we have. You know, really turn our, our energy, energies towards looking at solutions and, uh, you know, clearly there's a long path ahead of us. We're talking about, you know, practices that have been in place for decades, uh, and it really means that, you know, uh, you know, some real practical changes to uh, drug use practices and how these drugs are sold and distributed in the various, you know, uh, sectors. Um, and I think, you know, certainly there's challenges ahead of us, but, uh, you know, again, we're very encouraged by the fact that we're seeing uh, positive engagement uh, by the different segments of the industry. And certainly, it's, you know, the challenge is that you know, our animal ag industry in this country is not, you know, not, it's not a monolithic industry. There's a wide variety of, of uh, farms and producers across this country, from very small backyard operations to multi-state integrated operations, so, and everything in between. So certainly there's, there's a lot to take into account. We're a big country, uh, and, you know, again, I think we're trying to keep this uh, in, a, in a positive mode, in a mode where we're seeking folks to collaborate, uh, because in the end, I think that's where we're most likely to have success if, if we're working in a, in a collaborative mode. Let me ask Bill one, another question before I jump back to Beth. <laughs> um, Bill, you seem like such a nice guy. 
For, I mean, I, I mean that in a, in, a, in, a, in a nice way, in the sense that you're, you're not calling out anybody, which is generous of you. But last night, we were at a dinner. I had dinner with John Johnson, and we had a representative at the dinner who will be on stage uh, later, uh, who is a veterinarian. And I asked, because so much of the regulatory change and shift that you're talking about rests on greater veterinary engagement and, and writing of prescriptions for specific cases mm -hmm. with specific animals and herds in the, on the animal side of this. Um, in doctors, we have seen, in human doctors, and let me just be honest, a part of the reason you've had major shifts in healthcare from fee-for-service to others is there, there, in my words, kind of became a structural corruption in the process. Over-treatment became characteristic of the American healthcare system. So I want to ask you, Bill, can, can we trust this change and shift to a veterinary uh, directed uh, 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 foundation, is that something that we can have faith and confidence in, or do you run into some of the same kinds of risks that we've seen in the human health care <coughs> regimen? Well, certainly that, you know, that, that's ahead of us, so we're going to have to pay attention to that, but I, I would say that, you know, that this is a real game changer here as far as the, the, you know, we're talking about a situation now where we've got products that, uh, you know, are still available to over the counter. You know, we've been, what we're focused on is, dynamic in terms of how these products are accessed uh, and how they're distributed and used and certainly that you know making that shift is is a big deal and I think there you know there's been a lot of focus on the fact that as part of this strategy we're also eliminating growth promotion uses that's certainly important but I think this shift over to veterinary oversight is also uh, really a significant change because it's really going to change the dynamic in terms of how these products are used and and in a you know, uh, and really, in for, you know, brings into into focus now that they're legally, you know, these products cannot be accessed and used anymore unless there's the authorization of a licensed veterinarian, and it certainly is putting a lot of you know responsibility on the veterinary profession. And I think the veterinary profession recognizes that that responsibility should be on their shoulders. Certainly, they're they're now going to be expected to step up and you know and carry that weight uh, and so you know we're optimistic they can do that we're obviously we're, and we're working very closely with them thank you bill beth when you listen to bill and and you know i know some of the changes that are happening on the animal side of the yeah. equation you're our people side of the equation cdc and all that do you have any criticism of how they're doing it um not so much criticism i wouldn't yeah. say as much as i think that um, you know, we talk about One Health, and I think this is an opportunity mm -hmm. to really um, put that into practice. And we have, as you have, have um, sort of alluded to, we really we ha do have some experience now on the human side with um, how to um, implement stewardship programs and what does stewardship mean, and also a lot of experience about the power of tracking and of measurement. And this is tracking of resistant organisms, but also tracking of antibiotic use. And so I think that this feedback loop um, is just is very, very pivotal to success of this whole program. For example, many of you um, I know have heard of healthcare-associated infections, and this is a model that I think we're now, in the, on the human side, looking to apply to antibiotic use mm -hmm. and resistance. And this is a situation where um, every hospital uses an electronic system, they track their antibiotic resistant infections, they use that information in their own hospital for quality improvement and for feedback. The states have the capability of being able to see how hospitals are doing. They can target hospitals that are not doing a good job mm -hmm. and go in and say, well, why is that? Why are you not doing a good job? And what can we help you with? And at the national level, we benchmark. So we um, benchmark uh, central line associated bloodstream infections, for example, we publish this every year, 
and states can see how they're doing with respect to other states and how they're doing over time. So is it working? Uh, I mean, I, I yes, think that it is working. when we have discussions yeah. like this is, if we were having this discussion five years yes. ago, were we talking about superbugs and mm -hmm. if you know that you could, you could end up dying from going to the hospital yeah. and having certain infections mm -hmm. set in from just being there. Right. Um, so when we transport ourselves today, five years from now, mm -hmm. what will we have achieved? So for device-associated infections that we've been working on, and, and I'll mention that an important part of this, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more, is the role of the consumer in all of this. Right. Because I think for healthcare-associated infections in facilities, consumers said, it is not okay for my grandmother to get admitted to the hospital and get a central line and get it infected and have her die. It's not okay. And I think the consumers have driven that. CMS with the Hospital Compare program has you know, stepped in so that people can actually see how hospitals do on central line associated bloodstream infections, for example. And we have reduced central line associated bloodstream infections by 50% um, as we've been tracking this. So mm -hmm. I think that the principle um, works. It's, it, it needs, as Bill mentions, um, <clears throat> uh, having, you know, sort of momentum, and it needs momentum. It needs momentum from lots of different sectors, including, as I say, consumers and healthcare providers and the government um, and <clears throat> everyone working together. So going back to the stewardship thing, I think that Bill's point, and I think it's a really important, it's something that I'm not sure everybody actually completely understands, that this veterinary feed directive that he's talking about, that right. FDA means that, you know, if you are a farmer and you go to a vet feed store, um, you can buy antibiotics over the counter. You know, we talk about on the global scale about, you know, how antibiotics are so freely available. Um, you know, I was just in India a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, you can buy antibiotics. But in the veterinary world, that's still the case. You can go and just buy antibiotics. So this veterinary, veterinary feed directive means that for antibiotics that are important for human health, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. And it does mean that the veterinarians are going to need to adopt, understand some of these principles of stewardship, of the right medication for the right indication at the right dose for the right time. So again, we're not saying that you, we, we should not use antibiotics. We must use antibiotics. We have, you know, life-threatening conditions, sepsis. We must use antibiotics, but we have to use them correctly. And I think on the animal side, it's very important for the veterinarians, I think, to start to under, to start to, they, there are some lessons, I think, on the human side that they can take. And at the same time, I would say that this issue of measurement is really important. So on the human side, we have a module for this National Healthcare Safety Network program that I mentioned for an measuring antibiotic use. It electronically captures pharmacy information and it provides this feedback so that um, doctors and facilities can see how they're doing. And we're trying to work on a, ben on a metric so that we can benchmark. And I think something very similar um, really needs to happen on the veterinary side. You know, we all know that millions and millions of pounds of antibiotics being used is not good. Mm. But um, getting to the point where we actually understand some of these issues about who is using what, who is not making progress, where are, um, you know, where are we moving forward and where aren't we? And we can tie that to what we see in terms of resistance in the bacteria so that we really have a way of uh, being smart and targeted about interventions right, right. that um, you know are actually going to have an impact. Let me ask you and Bill both, um, and we're going go to go to all of you in a few minutes, so get your questions ready, but we've got a powerhouse crowd here. So we've got chickens and turkeys and cattle <laughs> yeah. and hogs. And uh, Just imagine John Johnson here taking all of his 60,000 producers and turning them into completely compliant, uh, happy hog farmers that, that, are, that are reducing antibiotic um, use, et cetera. You've just mentioned India, and so mm -hmm. it takes it. Can all of this be done without doing it in China, without doing it yeah. in India, without looking at other, you know, I don't, I, uh, where's our friend Anna from uh, Denmark? Yeah. Denmark, I, yeah. mean, I don't know. I mean, Denmark's often, point, Anna's right over here. She's, yeah. She has single-handedly changed Denmark's uh, yeah. use of antibiotics. Yeah. But, but it's Denmark, not to knock Denmark, but when you ask yourself if it's not happening, if you're not creating new standards yes. globally, doesn't the global antibiotic resistance yes. problem continue I mean, within the way yeah. we consume food? Yeah, I mean, the impacts. short answer yeah. is yes. Uh -huh. I mean, there's unfortunately a very frightening example 
I'm going to cough, excuse me. Anybody from the Chinese <laughs> embassy here? Yeah, a very yeah. frightening example, recent example. You know, there's an antibiotic called colistin, which is, we don't, uh, which is like the last ditch antibiotic. It's an old antibiotic. It has a lot of side effects, but I mentioned I was just in India. And they use it? They have such a huge problem with antibiotic resistance mm. that there are patients who are infected with bacteria where the only drug that's going to work is colistin. They use colistin mm. to save people's lives. Well, recently from China, we uh, heard about a, uh, an, a colistin resistant organism. Um, and as far as I know, we don't use colistin in farm animals in the US, but they do in other parts of the world. And so now this colistin resistant organism is being identified and popping up all over the world. This is terrifying. And so that could pop up here. Absolutely, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The thing is that the way that this resistance works is the resistance is carried on these mobile genetic elements, you know, mm -hmm. like they're, uh, somebody said, jumping genes. They're called plasmids. And so that means that the resistance capability can move from one type of antibiotic and one type of bacteria to another. That's very troublesome. So the bottom line is that there is no doubt that, you know, we need to address this globally. And actually, there is a, a lot of forward motion on that as well. There's um, uh, the, the world has signed on to this global health security agenda. And one of the important action packages, which actually Denmark is, is taking a leadership role in, is about antibiotic resistance. Um, so it, it's a global problem. We need a global solution. But I think that um, it's not as though all of our antibiotic resistance problems come from overseas. We've right. got our own homegrown problems. And so I think that, you know, we need to work on both fronts, but there's a lot that right. we can do domestically. Bill, could, could you help us address the, gl the global challenge from your perspective? Well, you know, I agree with Beth. Clearly, it's a, it's a global issue, and, and, you know, while we need to make efforts here at home, you know, we, we can't, given the global nature of, of markets and, and how, how products move across borders and people move across borders, you know, obviously we need to continue to pay attention to that as part of the overarching strategy. Certainly, it, it is an element of, of the national action plan is to focus on, on international collaboration because we, we need to pull in uh, other countries and work in collaboration with other countries. So I, I completely agree there. One point just to, I just want to throw, uh, add into Beth's earlier comment about tracking. I think uh, we, we, you know, completely agree that, you know, it's important for us to, um, as we move forward with, with putting in place measures and, and taking steps to address this issue, we need to, you know, make sure that we have ways of assessing you know our progress. Are we are we getting to where we need to go? Are we making the progress we need to make? How, do we need to make adjustments to what we're doing? Uh, so tracking is is critical. Um, uh, you know our goal is not to eliminate antibiotics in animal agriculture. Our goal is to uh, eliminate inappropriate inappropriate use of antibiotics. We we want to make sure that the uses that are out there are you know are necessary, are appropriate, are aligned with our you know current thinking on judicious use. Uh, you know, uh, Beth mentioned on the, on the human side, you know, act activities going on there to collect that kind of information. Uh, we're working on that on the, on the veterinary side. I think we have, uh, you know, some additional challenges because uh, the infrastructure that's in place here in the U.S. as it relates to human health care, you know, uh, which provides opportunity to tap into information, you know, doesn't really exist in that form on the veterinary side. So it does create a challenge for getting systems in place for collecting that data. Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, which we haven't mentioned yet this morning, is, is also playing a critical role in this effort in the animal ag sector, and we at FDA are working hand-in-hand -hand with USDA on this issue, and particularly on the issue of looking at what information would be helpful, what information do we need to collect, and really looking at USDA to, to take an important role in that effort. Uh, uh, just, just real short, uh, Bill, before I jump to the audience. Um, I've been reading a bit about vaccines and other non-antibiotic uses, uh, uh, applications in health. Just being self-critical for a moment, I mean, maybe you can lay out just in, in 30 seconds, what is the FDA doing? But if we put you in charge of everything, what else would you do that you're not doing today? Well, I mean, the one, that's a good point that you raise. I mean, certainly the notion of antibiotic stewardship or judicious use, um, I mean, as a first question that everyone should be asking is, in a particular situation, do I even need to be reaching for an antibiotic? 
or is there something else I, I could or should be doing to manage this problem? Um, and so that's, that's a really important issue, that, and, and it really does mean us critically looking at our current practices. Uh, and, you know, it's not a good enough answer to say, well, we've always been doing it this way and it's worked, so let's continue doing it. We need to look at how our, you know, our current practices and, and management practices in the different animal agricultural settings and be critical about uh, our use of antibiotics and try to determine whether there's alternative, alternative ways of dealing with it uh, that would reduce our reliance on antibiotics uh, to begin with. So that, that, to me, is a critical issue, but recognizing that in some cases we are going to have to reach for antibiotics, and it's, it's critically important that we keep that tool available to us. Um, but, again, we need to make sure that it's uh, you know, this again is both a human health and, a, uh, and, a, and an animal health issue because we need to make sure we preserve the effectiveness of these, of these drugs over the long term. Thank you. Let me take, let me open the floor to comments, questions. Um, floor is yours. Somebody be braver, I'll call on you. Yes, right here in the front. We've got a microphone coming. We have millions of people watching online who would have otherwise been here if not for the Metro. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Steve Proja, head of human cases firm. Uh-huh. And I've been looking at uh, this issue since the early 1980s. One thing I haven't seen is a decent quantification of what the relationship is between the use of antibiotics in animal husbandry and in people. Right. I've heard it discussed, but I haven't heard it addressed. It's number one. Number two, I'm overly concerned about the fact that we will and have been curtailing the use of antibiotics in animal husbandry. And there has been great fanfare all the way to the White House Rose Garden mm -hmm. and to 10 Downing Street. And this is not going to be the solution to our antibiotic resistance problem. I don't want to see our politicians become self-congratulatory saying, oh, we've handled the resistance problem by curtailing the use of antibiotics in great, animals. Great comment. So it, it really did, gets back both that question of linkage, but also causality. And, and I, I was talking to our friend from Denmark. Uh, about this issue that, that clearly antibiotic use has, has declined, but the impact on health has not yet, there's been no evidence. Mm -hmm. So are we plotting unscientifically into this, mm -hmm. this world? Yeah, well, I'd be happy to have uh, Bill's perspective on this also. But what I would say about this is that <clears throat> um, I agree with you that um, there are certainly some clear associations for foodborne pathogens, but from the perspective of disease burden, um, there's not an enormous disease burden from foodborne pathogens. And, but you could imagine, for example, if um, E. coli that cause urinary tract infections um, uh, are resistant, develop resistance, and that resistance is related to, um, you know, E. coli that you have in your gut from a resistant food, or, you know, an organism on, okay, so it might, it, it, so but th this is an area, I think, for further research. What I would say is that, having said that, that uh, I think, as you say, in many of the countries in Scandinavia that have re made huge, you know, transformational changes in the use of antibiotics in agriculture, that, you know, this being able to show a concomitant decline in human infections is, you know, sort of in process. Having said that, I think that we can all agree on two things. One is, it's not a good idea to be using millions of pounds of antibiotics. Uh, it's not a good, probably it's not good for the animals either. So let's work on that. That's one thing. And I think the second thing, to your point, is that, um, you know, use of antibiotics in people mm -hmm. drives resistant infections in people. And that's why at the CDC, we are laser focused on um, addressing that. And you know, thankfully, um, Congress has given us some resources with which to work on it, uh, you know, seriously. Bill, can, can we have your comment on this good question? It, yeah, just to add to that, I think uh, certainly, and I, I, I agree with what was said, I think uh, there's, you know, clearly decades of experience with the use of antibiotics. There's um, clearly uh, science supporting the associations with uh, use in various settings including in various, you know, uh, animal or uh, ag settings in terms of uh, leading to resistance emergence and, and the data supporting the uh, idea that we see uh, bacteria and foodborne pathogens uh, transferring from, from food-producing animals to, to humans. 
Uh, I do agree, though, that, you know, and I, it sort of goes back to the, a point I made earlier, is we certainly don't have all the definitive science that we would all like. Um, I think the challenge has been uh, linking all of those, connecting all those dots, and quantifying, you know, how much is this particular use contributing to the overall problem downstream in terms of, of, of human, you know, health impacts. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a, clearly a gap that, that, you know, more definitive science would be helpful. But again, I think uh, based on what we do know, you know, our view is that shouldn't be a reason for us to say that, you know, we shouldn't begin to, you know, uh, take steps uh, nonetheless. And, uh, and then to the second point, I think certainly uh, to me this goes back to the One Health notion that Beth mentioned that, you know, we, we have to be careful about not not ascribing, you know, blame to any one sector. Uh, I think it's it's important that we look at this holistically as being a problem that's being collectively contributed to, and we, we need to, you know, look at it from that perspective. Um, and I think that, you know, has been a challenge for us in just in terms of, of, of keeping the issue uh, in perspective and looking at it objectively and, and trying to, uh, you know, foster uh, collaboration across all sectors where, where, where antibiotics are being used. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, we just have a minute left for this section, but how many of you work for a drug company or a pharmaceutical company? So, oh, our first question does. So, um, I do like to ascribe blame, uh, not necessarily that directly, but uh, in contrast to Bill. Let me just ask just, just one kind of reckless question, because we have a <laughs> representative from Merck who's going to be a, Hasn't there been kind of a dereliction of, of participation or innovation from the drug sector? Because I was looking at this, you know, and what Merck is doing, and they've come out recently with a new antibiotic, but in contrast to so many of the events I do in the healthcare area where there's so much innovation, immunotherapy this, and genetic redesigning of that, and there's so much profound stuff going on, this is sort of the one pathetic area where we're worried about antibiotics not... So I'm just wondering why aren't, why aren't the incentives right so that the drug and pharmaceutical industry isn't diversifying beyond the stuff we're becoming resistant to? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, short answer. Uh, short answer. Uh, I'm going to give you two okay. parts of a short answer. Yeah, go ahead. Short answer is, you know, I think the incentives haven't been there, but I think that there's been a, they've made a, there's agree? a lot of progress. Yeah, okay. Um, I think the incentives are improving. The other part of my short answer is that while we need new antibiotics, we must pay attention to prevention because mm. the microbes are going to mutate. That's what they do. They've been doing that for eons and they're going to continue to do that. So prevention is at least as important as new antibiotics and innovation in prevention and being serious about prevention and not having it be an afterthought mm. is, I would say, certainly equally important to this idea of new antibiotics. Terrific. Bill, final word. No, I, I agree. I think it's critical that, you know, obviously a, a significant contributor to this is, is the fact that we, we can't rely on the fact that we're going to have new antibiotics coming in uh, to replace the ones that we lose. So uh, because of that incentive problem and because of just science and developing new antibiotics, so we need to make sure the ones we have, you know, that we extend the life as long as we, on the, of those products as long as we can. So that's critical for this uh, controlling resistance. Big round of applause for Beth, Beth Bell and Bill Flynn. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back in just a moment. Great.